You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for March 22nd, 2024. This week... Denmark notes, obesity drugs as heart disease modifiers, heart rate monitors, when journals publish obvious facts, and effect scores in sorting out signals from RCTs. We missed last week because I was in Denmark. I gave six lectures. Yes, the Danes are quite serious people. There are many people to thank. First, Dr. Morton Lamberts, who invited me to the University of Copenhagen, for the chance to grade the PhD of Dr. Anders Holt. Anders did an amazing PhD defense. The evidence for that is the experiments have already been published in four top cardiology journals. Thanks also to Martin Ruwald for showing me the EP lab at Gentoff Hospital. The EP crew there have been early adopters of pulse field ablation and have done many hundreds of ablation with this technology that Americans have had for two weeks. I love visiting EP labs because both the struggles and celebrations are universal. Thanks also to Soren Dietrichsen for a wonderful home-cooked Danish dinner with five young cardiology trainees and to Professor Gunnar Gilson who took me for a walking tour of Copenhagen. I then took the train to Aarhus. It looks like our house in U.S., but it's Aarhus and I love trains. I met Dr. Casper Peards at the train station and went immediately for an 80-kilometer up-tempo group bike ride. I learned that Denmark is not flat. My legs twitched for two days, but it was an unforgettable ride. Thank you, Casper. I then had two days in Aarhus. The first day I spoke on AF treatment. The lecture was televised across Denmark. Talk about pressure. We then did a nice journal club studying the Orbita 2 and Artesia trials. The next day, I gave two lectures at the Danish Heart Failure Meeting. Thanks to the OHO's crew for taking such good care of me, Professor Henrik Wiggers and Drs. Kasper Kurds and Dr. Sonny Larsen. Denmark has a shockingly robust research community. To become a cardiologist in Denmark, you must first complete a PhD. So the people power of all those ambitious young people is one of the reasons why they're leaders in evidence generation. But the other reason... Danes produced so many important trials became obvious on my tours of the hospital. Get this. Over and over again, my host would look into a room and say, Hey, John, that patient is actually randomized in an RCT. There is this culture of randomization in the country, and it is so impressive. Okay, okay. One of my Danish friends said I should be less biased toward everything being great in Denmark. He told me they actually have some problems. Though it was a struggle because Danes are very happy, I came up with two things. One was that doctors are paid a straight salary without productivity bonuses. This, a couple of doctors said, made doing that late add-on case a challenge. It sounded a bit like a Milton Friedman YouTube video. The second problem was that people don't become qualified cardiologists until well into their 40s. Now, while that may sound terrible to American doctors, it's less a negative in Denmark because they have proper time off for childbirth and they're paid a decent wage while in training. I guess the third negative would be that the weather in Denmark is not very much like Spain. Okay, second topic, obesity treatment that actually reduces cardiovascular outcomes. FDA last week approved semaglutide to reduce major adverse cardiac events, BASE, in patients with obesity and established heart disease. Decision stems from the 17,000 patient SELECT trial. It's a big deal because F- once FDA approves, this begins the process of clearing the drug for insurance coverage. Now, one of my six lectures in the last week was titled, 
should doctors prescribe weight loss therapy to patients with heart failure? And part of this lecture, I reviewed the SELECT trial, and let's briefly go over it now, because it is a true paradigm-shifting trial. Patients in SELECT were 62 years old, 72% male. Their mean BMI was not that big at 33. Two-thirds qualified for the study due to a previous MI. 18% had previous stroke. Another really important baseline characteristic was that 90% of patients were already on lipid-lowering meds and 86% were on antiplatelet drugs. This is notable because the gains from semaglutide happened while already on disease-modifying drugs. The results. After a mean follow-up of about 3.3 years, a primary outcome event of cardiovascular death or MI or stroke occurred in 6.5% of those on semaglutide, versus 8.0% of those on placebo. The hazard ratio was 0.80, so 20% reduction. The conference intervals range from 0.72 to 0.90, and the p-value is obviously highly significant. The first component of that composite primary outcome event was cardiovascular death. Here, it was 2.5 versus 3.0%. The hazard ratio is 0.85, 15% reduction, but, but conference intervals went from 0.71 to 1.01. This is kind of important because the CV death reduction was quite small and the upper bound was greater than 1. The p-value was 0.07. And since this was a confirmatory endpoint, the pre-specified p-threshold for superiority was not 0.05, but it was lower at 0.023. So, while the primary endpoint of SELECT was significant, the first secondary confirmatory endpoint was not significant. And I speak in this technical detail because the rules of the trial said that if the confirmatory endpoint did not reach the significance testing, superiority testing was not performed for the remaining confirmatory secondary endpoints. And that's important because the hazard ratio for the heart failure compo composite and all-cause death all look to be statistically significant in favor of semaglutide. For instance, death, all-cause death was 4.3 versus 5.2. Uh, that's a 0.9% absolute difference, which is more than the absolute difference of cardiovascular death. But again, we cannot speak of statistical significance of those lower secondary endpoints because the first confirmatory secondary endpoint was not positive. They did look at a subgroup analysis, and there was no obvious heterogeneous treatment effects. The weight reduction in SELECT was about 8.5%, and it was remarkably consistent throughout the trial. Adverse effects leading to stopping the medication or placebo were 16 versus 8% were dominated by GI disorders. They found no differences in cancer. So my comments, the interpretation here is easy, right? Semaglutide in this patient population is a disease-modifying treatment, period. It reduced MACE on top of other disease-modifying therapy. The risk reduction is modest, but it's clinically meaningful. And in fact, a 20% MACE reduction is similar to what we see with statins. And this was statistically persuasive. Now, there is a debate about whether it's a pleiotropic effect of the GLP-1 agonist effects or simply through weight loss. And use of these drugs generates a lot of discussion. There are appropriate concerns about long-term side effects. Remember, trials only go on for three years, four years. Uh, there's also concerns about the high cost of these drugs and, of course, the matter of weight regain after stopping the drug. Now, on the matter of weight regain, one of the lectures I listened to this week at the Danish Heart Failure meeting, uh, the lecturer asked us to think of weight regain after stopping the GLP-1 agonist as similar to the rise of LDL cholesterol after stopping a cholesterol-lowering drug. That kind of opened my eyes. Another doctor remarked that how we think of weight gain after stopping the drug turns on whether we consider obesity a medical condition or behavioral condition. For if it's a medical condition, we simply use GLP-1 agonists as if they were lipid-lowering drugs long-term. But if we think of obesity as a behavioral condition, we hope to use the drugs to change behavior that might allow coming off the drugs. However, if the GLP-1 agonist has important non-weight-related effects, 
then perhaps it should be used long term. I think there's a fair amount to think about and some uncertainty here. To be honest though, ultimately, tomorrow, in clinic, I don't think there is much of a mental struggle in this case. These are older patients, 60 year old patients, who have already established heart disease. If your patient fits this study criteria and has obesity, it's likely that semaglutide gives them a statin-like risk reduction, and I think that's important. Translating this data, however, to younger patients who are obese but healthier, or to obese children, is unwise. We know that GLP-1 agonists reduced weight in these groups, but we don't know if that translates to lower outcomes. Select enriched its population by recruiting patients who had established heart disease. A cardiovascular outcomes trial in a group with a lower placebo event rate would surely require many, many more patients. All right, next topic is the issue of wearable heart rate monitors accuracy. Now, Canadian authors from Toronto and Calgary, first author Ryan Quinn, have a short but important research letter in Jack regarding the accuracy of wearable heart rate monitors in sinus rhythm and in AF. Now, this should be one of the foundational principles in cardiology, so I even hesitate giving a sentence to it. But when you measure pulse in the periphery of the body, usually at the wrist, during AFib with higher rates, there is likely to be what's called a pulse deficit, right? Meaning, when you feel a pulse, you're measuring the arterial pulse wave that stems from cardiac contraction. In sinus rhythm and at reasonable heart rates, it's a, that's a great surrogate for heart rate because one pulse equals one QRS or one heartbeat. In AF, there's irregularly irregular rhythm, and when there are two tightly coupled heartbeats, the second one may not generate a good pulse in the periphery. Yet, wrist smartwatches that output heart rates are common. Fitness trackers most often rely on photoplethysmography, PPG technology to calculate heart rate. In other words, they're looking at pulses in the wrist. Now, the research team, led by Dr. Paul Dorian, senior author, wondered how the PPG monitors compare with standard ECG during exercise. And they just simply studied patients who were scheduled for routine treadmill tests, 81 patients, had device heart rates compared to the ECG heart rate, and they actually studied six different wearable heart rate monitors. This wasn't good news for the fitness trackers using PPG. At rest, the mean of absolute differences between the ECG measured heart rate and the device displayed heart rate were about 4.6 plus or minus 8.4 beats per minute and 7 plus or minus 11 beats per minute in sinus rhythm and AFib, respectively. So big difference. But at peak exercise, these differences were sta- substantially larger. They saw about a 14 beat per minute uh, difference in sinus rhythm and a 29 beat per minute difference during AFib. They also did correlations, and this too was bad. At rest, the correlation coefficient Uh, for sinus rhythm and AFib was 0.93 and 0.50 for for sinus rhythm and AFib, respectively. During exercise, the correlation coefficients were lower. It was 0.72 for sinus rhythm and only 0.30 during AFib. And they also found that as the heart rate measured by ECG increases, the device-detected heart rate becomes less accurate, especially for subjects in AFib and during exercise. Now, my comments. This is nice work. It's a modest experiment, but the systematic nature allows us to confirm what we all suspected, that watch-based heart rates during AFib are not reliable enough to act on. So if your patient uh, with AFib brings you one of those graphs from a fitness app that shows pretty good heart rate control, it would be wise to confirm this with a proper ECG tracing. Now, the authors don't write this, but I suspect that a chest strap monitor would do better, or perhaps watches capable of recording actual ECGs would do better. And of course, I'm pretty negative about many aspects of digital health because of the fact that they medicalize normal life, but being mad about smart watches, it's like being mad at the rain. They're well, smart watches are here to stay. So studies like this help us better understand these sorts of new technology. All right, next topic is when top journals publish established facts. This is a tough one for me. Journals must be struggling for to publish science. 
Jack is one of the top journals in cardiology. It has now published an observational study that finds, sit down for this, among patients with AFib, treatment with antiarrhythmic drugs associates with higher rates of bradycardia, syncope, and pacer implantation. And then the authors find this and they conclude, quote, precise evaluation of such risk should be undertaken before prescription of antiarrhythmic drugs, end quote. I mean, come on. We learned in medical school, before there was an internet, that nearly every AFib rate or rhythm control drug predisposes to bradycardia. But even more core to the job of clinical medicine is that we always, always balance benefits and harms of a proposed intervention. My friends, bradycardia is the, the chief adverse effect of nearly every heart rhythm drug. Dofetilide, which is a pure class 3 uh, antiarrhythmic drug is the only exception I can think of. Flecainide, propafenone, sotalol, dronetarone, amiodarone, all predisposed to bradycardia. You could almost say bradycardia is an effect as well as an adverse effect. It's what the drugs do. Brady effects from AFib drugs is literally the number one thing that we think about when using AFib drugs. And it has been this way for at least a half of a century. I mean no malice to the authors, and I totally agree with their findings. Of course they're correct. Hundreds of thousands of doctors worldwide, now and even in 1990, would agree with these findings. My questions are, why do such a study, and why would Jack publish this and promote it? I hope, I hope it is not, because... Wait, wait, John, perhaps I should do as the Stevie Nicks song says and keep my visions to myself. Well, this podcast would not be worth much if I did not say what I thought. So the thought entered my mind. I'm not saying it is true. It is just a thought that antiarrhythmic drugs are a competitor to AF ablation. And of course, there are no industry ads for antiarrhythmic drugs, but there are tons of ads for ablation. Anyways, I hope the business model had nothing to do with publishing a study that equates to finding that walking in the rain associates with being wet. All right, next topic. Do all patients in an RCD get the average effect? This is important because the number one job of an evidence-based clinician is applying trial data to the person in your exam room. Randomized trials provide treatment effects of an intervention. We take that effect and we apply it to our patient. But, but, there are oodles of complexities along this trail from effect size in a trial and our patient. For one, trials produce an average average effect size. Say there are 10,000 patients in a trial, there could be a group of patients benefiting a lot and groups actually harmed. And I think the best example of this is the Danish trial of ICDs in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Danish enrolled about 1,100 patients, half to randomized to the ICD and half to standard care. The average effect size was a non-significant 13% reduction, but the Kaplan-Meier curves were very, very close, essentially a negative trial. But the subgroup analysis showed a strong benefit of the ICD for younger patients over standard care and a trend for harm from the ICD in older patients. So if you look benefit in one group and harm in another averages to the null overall effect. We say that there was a heterogeneous treatment effect or HTE. That's jargon for saying the same intervention can exert different effects based on patient characteristics. Now, experienced clinicians can sometimes inherently sense, or at least we try to inherently sense that in our patients in the office. Uh, we sense that our patient in the office may be different in important ways from the average person in the trial. And of course, one way at this is subgroup analyses, which are usually in table three or four of the papers. And subgroup analyses attempt to get at this, but a subgroup analysis, remember, only uses one thing, like diabetes or no diabetes, or a blood pressure cutoff, like say blood pressure greater than or less than 130. One thing is a subgroup analysis. The problem is that trials are powered to sort signal from noise in the overall group, and the subgroups are these small slices of the overall population in a trial. Hence, if we lean too hard on subgroups, it's going to give us lots of false negatives, meaning we're going to miss signals, but it's also going to give us false positives. For instance, like the astrological sign signals seen with aspirin in ISIS-2 trial. 
Now, the JAMA has published perhaps a better way to look for these special patients who may benefit more or less or be different than the average effect size in trials. It's a complicated paper and it involves computer science and machine learning and modeling, but the idea is truly beautiful. Now, I admit to being intrigued, perhaps because I have so little experience with the inner workings of machine learning and computers, but here's the deal. They did what's called an effect score. So a group of authors did it with two separate trials of O2 saturation targets in patients with critical illness requiring intubation and mechanical ventilation. So a one paragraph background on the uh, trials that they used. The ideal O2 sat to titrate a patient on a vent is a matter of great debate. When I did ICU medicine back in the days, we thought that higher sats were better because of course more oxygen in the body has to be good. But the trials have not borne that out, and titrating to lower O2 saturation targets have proven to be similar in randomized controlled trials. But are these trials negative because there are patients harmed by lower targets and others benefited, and consequently, should tr clinicians try to individualize patients? Or should we just assume most or all patients in the trial get the average or null treatment effect and then translate that data in our ICUs? Thing is, observational studies have suggested that optimal oxygen targets may differ, say, in those with hypoxic brain injury versus those with septic shock. So the study in JAMA from a vast group of authors, first author Kevin Buell from the University of Chicago, senior author Dr. Matthew Chirpek from Melbourne, Australia, set out to use machine learning or patient characteristics and effect size in two oxygen target RCTs. Now, I'm going to surely oversimplify it, but the way I understand it is they took one trial and used the computer to associate a group of characteristics to form three layers, strata, based on whether they do better with either low saturation target, have no difference, or do better with higher targets. Basically, they did a subgroup analysis, but instead of using one feature, they used many features determined by the machine learning. I guess you could say they derived the three treatment groups from one trial, then came validation. They then took these effect scores and used them in a similar but different RCT, and lo and behold, the effect scores taken from one trial predicted serious heterogeneous treatment effects in the second trial. The specific results were, and I'll quote, the predicted effect of treatment with lower versus higher saturation targets for individual patients ranged from, sit down for this, 27% absolute risk reduction to a 34% absolute increase in 28-day mortality. That is a huge spread. It's enticing. So to test the waters, I put a tweet out this week saying that this looked really cool. And boom, the vast majority of evidence-based medicine clinicians that I interact with on Twitter all cautioned me to be very skeptical of not only of this method with its fancy computer science, but I should also be skeptical of the whole idea of trying to find such signals in trials. The message I heard from some very senior doctors was to assume that most patients in trials get the average effect. And if you find potential heterogeneous treatment effects, you should not act on it clinically until it was proven in future trials. And the authors of this oxygen saturation target trial say this explicitly in their paper, that is, that proof of a non-average effect in trials requires proof in future trials. Still though, I am not so negative and I want to remind you of a really nice paper along these lines. This paper is in the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology in 2018, first author Laughlin. Now, Laughlin et al. studied patients from the Accord and SPRINT trials. Remember, these were blood pressure target trials. And they beautifully showed that you could use patient characteristics in the cord to create a sprint trial score. That means, that is, the difference between how far an accord trial subject was from the average sprint subject, and they used six characteristics. When they did this, they learned that in a cord which found no difference with lower blood pressure goals, there were plenty of patients like those in sprint. And for those patients, lower blood pressure was, in fact, better. Take a look at this paper. It's really cool, and it's similar to what we're doing here with effect scores. Look, I'm clearly a novice, but as a clinician, I'm very interested in getting the most out of trials, so let me know what you think. Are there average effect sizes all we should assume, 
or can we actually find important signals of heterogeneous treatment effects in trials? I've basically run out of time, but I want to preview a study I will discuss next week. There is a comprehensive meta-analysis of RCT only that studies the interactions of heart failure and AFib with the use of mineralocorid receptor antagonist drugs, MRA drugs. The study first author is uh, Alarenza Orai, and the senior author is William McIntyre from Mixed Masters. It's in the European Heart Journal. I'll link to it. It's a really nice paper. I call uh, MRAs my secret weapon, so we'll talk more about that paper next week. So that's it for this week in cardiology, and as always, I'm grateful that you listened. I'm happy to be back. Remember, friends, if you like this podcast, please give us the time to uh, make a rating on whatever app you use. Write us a brief review. And if you disagree with me, go to the heart.org Medscape Cardiology website, write a comment. Uh, I love interacting, and I also learn from these. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.